Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's virtual solutions meetup. On today's agenda, we will discuss the new coronavirus recovery solutions. Uh, we are recording this meetup and we'll be posting the recording to YouTube. I will share the YouTube playlist in the chat window, as well as a feedback survey that you can provide us feedback on the meetup itself. So you will find that recording in the um, YouTube playlist once it's posted. Um, we also post this information to our meetup groups on meetup.com. Later on in the meetup, we'll have a section for Q&A. So if you'd like to submit questions, you can use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Click that button. You can submit a question to us. We'll answer it during the Q&A section. Um, so with that said, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Scott to get us started. Okay, thanks a lot, Matt. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I know everyone is very busy heading into a holiday weekend and also working on several coronavirus-related issues in their community. And we really do appreciate you taking the time today to learn more about the new recovery and reopening solutions. Uh, my name is Scott Ottman, and I lead the Arches Solutions Group here at Esri. And we have with me today a whole host of team members who've been working on many of the recovery and reopening solutions we want to show you. So for those of you that are new to ArcGIS Solutions, let me just take a minute to talk about what we do. Um, the ArcGIS Solutions Group is part of Esri's development team, and our mission is really to help you maximize the investment you're making in ArcGIS by closing the gap between what our core technology provides and what you do in your organizations every day. And we do that by providing a set of configurable maps and apps that are organized around the work you do. They come with the software product and they're fully supported. So one aspect of our work is the technology we're doing, we're developing to help you maximize that investment in location-based data and technology. But another key aspect of the work is doing that in a very collaborative way with the community um, and incorporating best practices and ultimately uh, helping you with implementation support as you begin to deploy these solutions in your, in your community. And many of the solutions we're gonna show you today are direct results of engagements and conversations we've had with communities across the country over the last few weeks. The third aspect of our work is a network of Esri services and partner offerings that can help you implement, sustain, and enhance these solutions if you do need additional capacity or expertise in this time of need. Our team is really focused on really enabling you as ArcGIS users to be successful, but we know there may be cases where you might need additional capacity or expertise. So uh, as a team, our mission is really to help you deliver maps and apps quickly throughout your organization, stay current with our technology and leverage the new capabilities that are coming in our GIS, and ultimately unlock the geospatial information you have in your organization so it can be leveraged by many. And today we're gonna show you a set of solutions that really run the gamut from analysts in a public health organization and executives who are monitoring key performance trends, you could be volunteers or others managing a wellness program in your community or even your local economic development or planning organization that's interested in small business recovery. And as I mentioned earlier, right, we, we, don't, we know we can't do this alone. It's really important that we leverage the collective knowledge of the community. And so ultimately, all of the feedback we got from communities early in our development life cycle has been very important to us. And the feedback you give us today is also really critical to the continued evolution of these solutions. So obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our communities, our lives at a local scale, at a national scale, and even at a global scale. And when the pandemic first hit here domestically, um, we worked really closely with our DRP team, our disaster response team, and communities across the country to develop a set of solutions that are available for response needs. We then grew that collection of solution offerings to begin to look at things like business continuity or force readiness for uh, National Guard organizations. But over the last few weeks, as conversations about reopening and recovery have started to evolve, we started to turn our attention to uh, the needs of our communities and that are starting to think about recovery and reopening. And there are high-level guidelines that were provided by the CDC through the White House's Opening Up America uh, report. We've seen the National Governors Association put out a set of recommendations for the governors here in the United States. And ultimately, each state and many counties have developed plans 
that are guiding the reopening activities in their community. And as we began to look at those plans and aggregate up a set of patterns, we saw a common set of needs that we wanted to address. The first thing is how do we help uh, really expand the capacity of our testing resources? And while we can't provide the testing equipment or the um, kind of things you need to do the actual testing, what ArcGIS can do is really help you optimize the location of those testing locations and ultimately help you understand if you're focusing your testing efforts on the vulnerable populations in your community. The next thing we wanted to look at um, is how can we help communities monitor these key reopening metrics that they're establishing for their community and ultimately guide uh, the reopening efforts with the data that you're collecting on important things like symptoms, cases, healthcare capacity, et cetera. Uh, and ultimately help you provide a destination where you can communicate these key metrics and reopening plans, as well as many of your reopening initiatives to stakeholders in your community. The next thing we looked at is how can we help understand the health condition of homebound individuals in your community? And a homebound individual may be someone with uh, an elderly member of, of your community who can't get out because of the pandemic and, uh, and it makes it very difficult to get the basic necessities like uh, medicine, food, and just overall wellness, understand the overall wellness of their uh, health during this time. And ultimately, are we monitoring compliance with health orders and resolving them as necessary? And many of those things are kind of related to the social distancing guidelines we're all following in our respective communities. And the last area we wanted to look at is ultimately the impact on small businesses and how can local governments in particular and even state government programs promote small businesses that are operating during the pandemic and really help be a, a promotion arm for those businesses that are trying to maintain some level of operations. And then at the same time, really get a good understanding of what, how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted their business and align them with resources that may be available. So what we're gonna show you today is a whole collection of recovery and reopening solutions that are designed around these kind of key business needs. How do you optimize and promote testing locations that are available in your community? How do you monitor the key recovery metrics um, and reopening metrics that you may be establishing? Ultimately, how do you start to protect the vulnerable populations as we reopen? And then promote the small business recovery as we begin to loosen up some of the health, um, stay at home orders, the health restrictions, and we do start to see commerce begin to pick up in our respective communities. And we wanted to provide all of that information or at least the public engagement aspects of that information in a destination that you can use to engage the public. And what you'll see in these, this collection of solution offerings is there really are designed to target state and local government organizations who are developing these reopening recovery plans and using the data to drive the decisions we're making in our community. So with that context in mind, what I'd like to do first is turn it over to Chris Fox and have him show you um, some of the work we've done on a new hub initiative and the coronavirus recovery dashboard. So Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Scott. So first I wanna start with um, a new initiative for ArcGIS Hub. Um, the Coronavirus Recovery Initiative template includes a site that your organization can configure with your own branding and share authoritative coronavirus recovery and reopening information. The template comes with three public sites. Uh, this main site is designed to be your destination for your community's recovery and reopening efforts. It highlights how the public can view key recovery metrics, um, how they can learn more about communities reopening plans, how they can support small businesses, how they can protect home, home, homebound individuals with wellness checks, and find nearby testing uh, locations. The small, biz, small business recovery site is designed for local business owners that want to participate in the small business recovery program and highlight the services they are providing during the pandemic. And the wellness check site is designed for engaged members of the public who would like to volunteer to perform wellness check-ins. 
We'll be talking more about each of these sites uh, and their associated solutions later on in the meetup. But for now, I want to spend a little bit more time talking about our Coronas, uh, coronavirus recovery dashboard solution, um, which we have embedded here on the main site. Uh, let's jump out to that dashboard in another tab and, and explore some of the capabilities. So the coronavirus recovery dashboard can be used by public health and other emergency response agencies to tabulate and monitor key recovery metrics and trends that help inform decision makers uh, during phase reopening efforts. And these metrics and trends that we included in the dashboard come from recommendations made by the White House in opening up America again, and the roadmap to recovery from the National Governors Association. The trends along the top highlight um, whether the community is seeing an increase or decrease in symptoms and cases over the last 14 days. And the metrics along the bottom provide insights into testing facilities, capacity to provide robust testing for the public, for at-risk populations, and for healthcare workers, and also gives us insights into our healthcare facilities to treat all existing patients, uh, be able to surge and handle increased patient volume, as well as capacity to con conduct contact tracing. Uh, these metrics and trends can all be visualized for the entire state, or more specific locations within the state, for example, region, counties, or municipalities. We also provide a mobile version of this dashboard so that when you embed it on your site, it displays well on a mobile device. And this dashboard can be customized to show the trends and metrics you have ad identified for your community. And we provide an ArcGIS Pro project with a set of tools that walk you through how you can tabulate your metrics and calculate your own trend lines. Um, so with that, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Lauren, who's going to talk a little bit more about our coronavirus testing sites solution. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chris. So as Chris mentioned, uh, testing as Chris mentioned, uh, expanding testing capacity is one of those key metrics for recovering and reopening. And the coronavirus testing site solution really focuses on increasing that testing site capacity by answering three big questions. Um, where are our high-risk populations? How can we identify testing sites that maximize coverage of those high-risk populations while uh, being conservative with resources? And then how can we communicate what we find with the public? And so the, those first two questions are really answered by a uh, ArcGIS Pro project. So let's go ahead and take a look at that Pro project. Uh, when you open the testing site allocation Pro project that comes with the coronavirus testing sites uh, solution, you'll notice that there are two groups of tasks. The first, uh, the getting to know testing site allocation has two tasks that are really here just to just meant to orient you as the user. The first talks about required data sets um, and what you get with the Pro project. The second really talks about the methodology that we use to identify those testing sites. <clears throat> the real meat and potatoes here is the how to use the testing site allocation set of tasks. And you can see they're broken down into three tasks, which get at those two questions that we talked about. First, we're gonna identify our areas of risk, where are our high risk populations. Um, we'll identify candidate sites, and then finally identify those best uh, testing sites. So let's take a look at what these are. Um, first, you're prompted to go ahead and add your boundary data to the map, and then we zoom to it. I'll go ahead and just turn on my test data. Um, just a, a note about boundary data, what we mean by boundary data. This can really be any set of um, geographic polygons that you're interested in. This is DePage County, Illinois, um, down to the block group level. Um, but if you are looking at a county, uh, you can certainly do that as an entire state. Um, just keep in mind that the lowest granularity that we recommend going to, or I suppose the highest granularity, is uh, census block groups. And that's because the population data that we're gonna be using to assess risk is using ACS data, and that only goes down to the block group level. Um, so if you're using a large area, also uh, think about um, how granular, granular you need to go. Census tracts are fine, generally, if you're a really big county, et cetera. 
So once you have your boundaries added, we start, uh, we start populating these boundaries with key risk information. So key point counts such as maybe number of care facilities or healthcare facilities, uh, key risk demographic data, um, these are all configurable, uh, and then finally total population. And just a note about these tasks, <clears throat> they do use the enrich tool, so they consume credits. Keep that in the back of your mind as you're considering what granularity you need to go down to for your boundaries as well. But once we have all of that uh, data in our boundaries, we can go ahead and create a risk surface. When we run this tool, the, uh, the result looks something like this where dark blue areas are areas where we have large concentrations of at-risk populations, and light green areas are areas of lower risk. You'll also notice here in the legend that the closer you are to number one, the higher risk you are. Uh, so, uh, but visually, dark blue is high risk, uh, light green here is low risk. We also give you the, op uh, the option to go ahead and publish this out as a, uh, as a web layer if you're interested in sharing, sharing this with the public. But we've just answered our first question, where are our high-risk populations? They're here in these blue areas. Um, once we've identified those, we can go ahead and move on to our uh, candidate sites. We give you a step so you can configure any existing sites that you have. Uh, we give you some guidance on how to find candidate sites. Uh, Highfeld has some very good information, so does business analysts if you have it. Um, if you have local data sources, you should consider using those first. And then finally, we append those. And what, these, what it looks like when you finish these steps is you have, incre you have uh, existing sites in green here and uh, candidate sites in gray. This is a really great opportunity to make sure that your uh, gray sites, your candidate sites, are covering those areas of high risk. And we've done a pretty good job uh, with this test data. This isn't real data. But if this were, I might consider adding another site here, maybe another one here. But once we've uh, finished identifying our candidate sites, we're going to go ahead and answer that third question, how can we maximize uh, coverage of our need. And the first thing we need to do is convert these polygons into need points, like how, uh, how much need is in each of these areas. When we do that, it looks like this. Each one of these points takes into account all of that risk information from the polygon and creates a point from it so we can allocate uh, those points to a chosen facility. And now we can go ahead and choose which facilities uh, we think are best. Uh, the, the one configurable thing we need to do here is choose a default travel time cutoff. This is pre-configured as drive time, but there are additional steps that you can take to configure it for some other mode of transportation if that's more appropriate for your community. Um, and you want to think about the, uh, the size of your geographic area when you do this. Um, since this is a relatively small county, I've run it for a 10 minute drive time. What that means is that every site will chosen site will be within 10 minutes drive of all need. And when we run this, the result looks like this. The chosen sites are in blue. The, our existing sites have been allocated need since they're already serving the community. And you can see we have actually uh, managed to site our sites over areas of need fairly well. So now we have uh, answered our second question. How can we maximize coverage while minimizing the need for facilities in areas that are at high risk? Uh, notice here that uh, my concern about not having a site here is probably warranted. We might want to try this again uh, and, and add a site here. But we've done a pretty good job. And now we want to move on to our third question, is, which is how do we share this with the community? And our last step in the PRO project focuses on this. It selects out the chosen blue sites and publish this, publishes them up to a web layer that comes with the coronavirus testing site solutions. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. When we publish these sites up from, ArcGI, or from ArcGIS Pro, they do need a little help. They don't have useful information in them quite yet directly from Pro, information like what are the operating hours, 
what's the vehicle capacity? Do they offer walk-in or drive-up services? Do you need a doctor's note? All of that. Um, so the testing sites manager is a configuration of a web app builder that has editing tools to help you do this quickly and efficiently. The first one is a freehand uh, a batch editor. So you can go ahead and select multiple sites and update attributes on all of them at one time. We also have a single site editor. So you can go ahead and select a site and update it at one, one at a time. And we also have a data loader just in case you'd like to batch load uh, from a CSV if you really want to. But once your data is configured the way you want it, it has all of the information that the public will need. The public can then access that using the testing sites locator, which we saw on the hub site. And as a, a, a person in the public, if I want to go get tested, I can just go ahead and either drop a point on the map or enter uh, an address here. I can see which testing sites are within my five mile radius and I can select one and I get all of the information that I need about how to find, uh, how to get to that testing site. Um, it's walk-ins, I don't need a referral, I'm going this Saturday at four. And that is the coronavirus testing sites uh, solution. I will go ahead and turn it over to Jeremiah for our wellness check solution. Thanks, Lauren. So I would like to talk, take a few minutes to talk about the, the new wellness check solution that's part of recovery. Now, Lauren just uh, showed us how we can better serve vulnerable populations by ensuring that they are able to be tested. But uh, protecting vulnerable, vulnerable populations doesn't stop at the testing. In many cases, the vulnerable populations are homebound individuals, uh, oftentimes the elderly or people with uh, existing medical conditions. So citizens can register themselves or a loved one in your community to receive wellness checks by clicking request assistance. This opens up a simple public facing form where you can fill out information about the individual requesting wellness checks. You give it a location about where, where you are in case uh, food delivery needs to happen. Uh, you can att attach a photo for more of a, more of a personal connection. Uh, define the type of wellness check you would like to have. Uh, many communities are just conducting regular check-ins or phone calls, and some are doing meal delivery. Uh, we do ask for an age because some communities are being reimbursed by FEMA based upon uh, senior status. And then notifying the community, uh, the hosting organization of any medical conditions and emergency contact, oftentimes a person who will be filling out this form. So that's how you can sign up for a re uh, wellness check. Now, who's going to do these wellness checks are going to be vol volunteers that you can enlist to help uh, perform the wellness checks. Volunteers can find out more information by clicking the learn more. And that goes to the wellness checks page that Chris was showing earlier. Now, this site will lay out a whole process for what needs to happen for a volunteer to really become part of the program. The very first part is to join community. And I've already clicked this button. Uh, what it's going to require me to do is use a RTS online login to really partake in joining this community. And I've already done that. If I don't have a login, I'll be prompted where I can create one. And you can see in the upper right, I, I'm logged in. Uh, then what I'll do is I will specifically volunteer to help for this initiative. By clicking this, again, another simple form that I'll have access to once I've logged in. I'm just gonna provide my name, general contact information, uh, just some specifics if I'm willing to travel and if I'm a, a volunteer, uh, if when I'm able to volunteer. So this gets submitted back to the host organization, both the request for a wellness check and the person being a volunteer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause and I'm going to turn it over to Chris, who's going to play the role of a volunteer coordinator that will really do the approvals of this before the work begins happening. Thanks, Jared. So as a volunteer coordinator, it's my job to approve volunteers and match them with wellness checks. So the wellness check volunteer manager application allows me to manage approval and status of both volunteers and people requesting wellness checks. So here I see a list of volunteers that have applied. First, I'm going to select a newly submitted volunteer. So we can see here Lee Carson has a status of submitted, not yet approved. So I'm going to select her. I can edit the record and set to active. 
Many communities may do more detailed background checks before approving a volunteer, um, but at this point we've, we've activated uh, Lee as a volunteer. So I can notify her that she's been approved, and I can also, in this notification email, son, send her some of the information and the apps that she's going to need to install in order to conduct the wellness checks. So once a volunteer has been approved, they can be paired with a wellness check. Um, so here we have an assign volunteer button. This is going to open a project uh, in Workforce for me to make the assignment. So if we click that button, it would open my Workforce project. I can see for all my workers or volunteers, I can see a list. I can see the number of assignments that have been assigned to them. So one thing that we want to make sure we do is not overload one volunteer with many wellness checks to, to conduct. So we can balance out the workload here. Um, I can also see on the map the volunteer, their location, and I can also see the assignments, the wellness checks. So let's select one of these uh, wellness checks, and I'm going to assign a volunteer. Um, if, you're, if they're requesting food delivery, we might want to pay attention to the distance uh, that the volunteer is from the individual assigned to do the wellness check so that we put volunteers near their wellness check so they don't have to travel as far but I'm going to assign Lee, and now Lee will see that information uh, when she needs to do her um, uh, wellness checks. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Jer, who's going to take the role as the volunteer uh, conducting the wellness checks. Great, thanks, Chris. So I'm going to go back to the, the role of, of being a volunteer, and what I'm doing now is I'm mirroring my phone. So you saw earlier that Chris notified me to get a couple apps ready, uh, specifically Workforce and Survey123. So as a volunteer, I will have Workforce uh, on my phone. And when I first open it up, what I'll see is a list of the wellness checks that I need to conduct. And you'll notice that it says wellness check and food delivery. Uh, they're categorized by the type. So if it's just a wellness check and a phone call, I, I can uh, uh, really see what type of activity I need to take. So I have one wellness check and I can get some information about that person and I need to follow up on. My job as a volunteer is to really start this process and I will want to click this little button on the right here that will open up the ability for me to survey or, or really conduct a specific wellness check. Uh, information gets carried over about that individual. So I have their phone number. If I wanna do a quick call, I can do that. Um, then I can just say, when am I uh, completing this call? So if I didn't, if I did it earlier this morning and I want to follow up, I can uh, make that note. It's asking me if I made contact or not. Uh, if I didn't, am I leaving a message? If I did, then I get a series of other questions. Uh, so do we do a call or a visit? Uh, if I did a visit, I, I'll get asked if I left food. But then I really get into the questions of monitoring the health of my vulnerable population. Now, are we experiencing COVID-19 symptoms? Uh, from the volunteer's perspective, what is the overall well-being? Uh, so we can just say seemed in great spirits. Whoops. And then lastly, do we recommend that the hosting organization follow up? So if there's anything of concern, we might want to flag the hosting organization to say, you know, there's something of concern here. We really want you to check in on this individual a little bit more detail. I click my survey and that submits my wellness check. And I basically just complete my project, which will then take it off the list. So earlier I had three wellness checks. Now I have two and I can just keep on going down the list as a volunteer to complete my assignments. And then Chris, as a volunteer coordinator, may ultimately start to reassign some of the same uh, wellness checks to me uh, at, a, at a later point. So what I'm gonna do uh, is really come back and I'm gonna play the role of the host organization. So this might be an executive in, in the health office or someone that's managing the overall volunteer program. And what's provided is, is a dashboard. And a few things that this dashboard does is it shows me the overall status of the program. So how many wellness check requests have we received? We can see a little bit about who's signing up for these requests. Uh, how many volunteers? I can see this over time. So am I getting a big flux of uh, volunteers? Are they falling off? Do I need to get some more? 
the wellness check status, really kind of the health symptoms that we're seeing. I can interact with these charts on the map to see what are those areas of concern. You know, maybe I have hot spots on the map that I might want to see. I can also see a list behind to see anyone that might have poor well-being or someone that's showing uh, symptoms that I may need to follow up on. And then lastly, just the dashboard that shows the overall status of which checks are not completed yet that we may need to follow up on. So that's an overview of the wellness check solution and how I can manage both the volunteers as well as people requesting those wellness checks to help ensure that the most vulnerable in my community are getting the care that they need. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike and Mike, who are going to talk about the small business recovery solution. Thank you, Jeremiah. Um, let me share my screen. So Mike Daigle and myself, Mike Brown, are going to show off the coronavirus small business recovery solution. So this is a set of info products which we've designed for local governments to implement a business recovery program. The applications are designed to really promote the small businesses um, that enlist with a focus on health and safety. So I'm going to start off by showing a set of health violation applications that are a subset of the solution. So here we have the health violation reporter. This application can be used by the general public to let the health department know which businesses are following local health orders and safety guidelines. So they can submit a report with this information and health department staff can manage that info using the health violation manager application. So here we can see individual details associated with the report and if response is needed there are built-in fields in the feature service to allow us to do so. So we can say that this report has been received to change the status. To view metrics, summary metrics for these reports, we can use the health violation dashboard or dig in and look at individual reports or filter for specific characteristics. So now I'm going to pass it over to Mike Daigle, and he's going to show how economic development agencies can work with small businesses to promote their recovery. Mike. As, co as communities have started executing their reopening plans, many have created small business recovery programs to promote small businesses, ensure health order compliance, and provide economic resources to affected businesses. One way economic development agencies are promoting small business recovery is by sharing accurate business listing information with the public. The small business locator can be used by the public to find businesses in their area. So as a member of the public, I'm looking for small businesses to, to support. So I could use the provided uh, filters to refine the listings, search for an address, or simply click on a map to view business listings. It includes details like hours of operation, services offered, ordering options, and even any employment opportunities that might be available. Listing details are provided directly by small business owners that have joined a small business recovery program. So let's take a look at how that works. As a small business owner, I'm interested in joining the recovery program and promoting my business in the small business locator. Here, back at the coronavirus recovery site, you've seen a few times, I can view step-by-step -step instructions. First, I wanna join the program. In this case, I've already done that, and we can see that I'm signed into the site. Next, I want to list my business. Uh, once I've created my account, I can access the small business listing form. And here I can provide, uh, I can communicate health compliance, and I can provide all those listing details that we just saw highlighted in the small business locator, like the hours of operation, um, social media handles, services, and ordering options. Small businesses are dealing with a, a challenging and changing landscape, which means that their listing details are gonna change over time and, and maybe even rapidly. 
um, as additional services are provided, hours of, hours, hours of operation expand, or maybe employment opportunities become available. So also available on the coronavirus recovery site, I can manage my listing. The small business listing manager allows me to view my current listing, any uh, comments that might be might have been provided by the uh, economic development agency that's running the small business recovery program. And then I can access the small business listing form again, this time with a mind towards editing my existing listing. So for example, I might now want to add some uh, employment opportunities. And maybe some uh, specific contact information for that. Uh, I'm going to hand it back over to the other Mike, and he's going to show you how economic agencies can administer their small business recovery program. Thank you. So economic development staff can manage the program with a couple of apps, which we're going to talk about now. So the first is the small business program manager. So this is an app for staff to really review those business listings. If they need to, there is a public flag in the business listing so that they can remove it from that public facing locator map. They can also send out a business impact survey to business owners. And the idea here is to create a communication pathway between business owners and economic development staff. So this survey is built to record the pandemic's impact on these businesses with a focus on how it's impacted their operations, their workforce, and their finances. So after aggregating all this information, it can let the economic development agency know how they can support small businesses in their region. And to review that information, we can use the small business impact dashboard. So we can review summary metrics again, or filter this data based on specific characteristics, and even dive in and view individual responses for business with all of their details here in the pop-up. So that was the coronavirus small business recovery solution. We'll just walk through that pretty quickly, uh, but there are a lot of apps. So uh, with that, we're gonna hand it back over to Scott. Thanks a lot, Mike. So the team just showed you a whole collection of recovery and reopening solutions that are available for state and local government communities. And you may be asking yourself, well, how can I access those? If you go to solutions.arcgis.com, you'll see a banner across the top here, and that'll take you directly to all of the coronavirus solutions we've developed for the community. Uh, and you'll see that, um, there's the testing sites and recovery dashboard that I, uh, we mentioned today and the uh, wellness checks and the small business recovery. You'll also see some of the other solutions that are available to the community as well too that you may also want to take advantage of. Perhaps you want to use some of the information products that we developed in the response solution to help with things like meal sites or school openings in your community. Um, and deploying these solutions is really easy. I can come into the small business recovery solution here. Um, read more about the solution we showed you today, get a sense for exactly what software is required and what specific information products I get when I deploy the solution to my organization, and then ultimately walk through some simple steps to deploy it, and ultimately some workflows that we showed you today to manage those listings, administer your program, and ultimately report the health violations that Mike showed you earlier. And to deploy these is really simple. I can come back here real quickly, um, select deploy. Ultimately, what it's going to do is ask me to log in uh, with my ArcGIS Online credentials. Um, and then I can just hit deploy. And what this is going to do is stand up all of the maps and application or the maps, applications, and feature layers that are required for the solution. And when it's done, um, you can just open that content up in your ArcGIS organization. In this case, I've deployed the recovery dashboard 
and I can see the dashboard that Chris Fox mentioned, along with the web map and layers that are included in that solution. And I have a link back to the help and a design document that walks me through how all of these layers work within the maps and the applications. So it's really uh, easy for you uh, to kind of deploy these solutions in your ArcGIS organizations and begin to take advantage of them quickly in your recovery and reopening efforts. So we, I just wanted to wrap, maybe Matt, before we take a few questions um, to share some resources. I just showed you the, um, the destination for all of our COVID solutions. If you're an existing ArcGIS user, um, you can certainly take advantage of those solutions now. If you need access to ArcGIS software, uh, we have some resources available to you through our disaster response program. Um, and you can obviously get in touch with your account representative as well to talk through the options available for you. The other thing I want to mention is there's a whole host of related uh, coronavirus resources on our GIS hub. Um, and I would encourage you to continue to look at that as a resource for new content, new solution offerings, and ultimately new offerings from Esri uh, at large. So I'll just wrap with, um, we really would like your, before we take some Q&A, we really would like your feedback on the meetup today and the solutions we shared. Our, uh, do you find them valuable for your community? Do you have ideas for new solutions? And ultimately, what can we do to improve the meetups in the future? Uh, and thank you very much for your time today. And what we'll do, Matt, is maybe just open it up for some questions that accumulated um, and then see if anyone else has any other thoughts or comments before we break. All right, so we had a, a few kind of around the, the concept of the identity, in particular for a volunteer identity, um, yeah. but I guess that would also apply to the business side. So me as a business owner, I'm, I'm going to have an identity as well. So, um, and the kind of the question of how does ArcGIS Hub Premium fit into that identity, um, kind of that, sure. that side of it, how do they access that um, from, from a licensing perspective. Yep. But I think it's kind of all in that same bucket. There's like multiple questions in that kind yeah, of Yeah, it's a really good point. So both the coronavirus wellness checks and the coronavirus small business recovery solution we showed you today leverage ArcGIS Hub Premium and the community identities. Um, in the case of the wellness checks, obviously your volunteers would have an identity uh, that they would use to manage the assignments and wellness checks they're doing. Um, and in the case of the small business recovery, those business owners in your community would have an identity and they would use that to create their business listing and to maintain that business listing going forward. And then the next question about um, for when, when, when a user deploys the, the initiative, or sorry, the ArcGIS Hub initiative, mm -hmm. do they get everything that was shown as well? Or what's the kind of the deployment pattern there? That's a good question. Yeah, so there's, um, when, you active, when you have Hub Premium, you can activate the initiative, and then there will be a site on that initiative that uh, describes how to configure it. And as part of that process, it'll walk you through the solutions to configure through that, uh, the ArcGIS Solutions app I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, so you don't, it's kind of a two-step process, but it is all just done through a browser. You activate the initiative in your hub organization, and then you um, deploy the solutions. And then just another question, mainly more of a point to reiterate, there's a, a question about, is there kind of detailed step-by-step -step instructions on the solutions? And I will point you back to the, our help documentation on the solutions site. That's correct. Um, so I think that's, you really can kind of dive through. These are also fully supported by Esri technical support as well. So between the help documentation, uh, support, you, you can get a lot of that kind of step-by-step -step instruction there. Um, one question about, is, is it possible for these to work with Enterprise Portal? Yeah, so it's a really good question. Um, the wellness checks and the uh, small business recovery require Hub Premium, and that is only supported in ArcGIS Online. So those are, you know, you will have an ArcGIS Online organization for those solutions. And the recovery dashboard is supported in uh, ArcGIS Enterprise. And I believe, I'm not sure, I'd have to go look about the testing sites. Maybe Lauren, if you know offhand, will that, that I believe that'll work as well in Enterprise too, but quite frankly, that I'll one's- Double the, check. Yep, yeah, the, um, 
the testing sites is a public application, obviously, so it's designed to be publicly accessible. So and do the analytics, but you actually need content from the Living Atlas. So I guess when you say enterprise, we'll have to we'd have to get to the specifics okay. of how your enterprise is configured. It's documented as only for ArcGIS online um, because yep. there would be extra steps in in the Living Atlas layers that we use. Um, That's right. Yep. But but I think if you there's certainly no technical reason if you know how to configure that that you couldn't use the testing sites locations on enterprise. But uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, those those kinds of questions were were really just for ArcGIS online. Yep. And then there's a question that just came in regards to the recovery uh, dashboard. Um, are there specific services available that will help populate the metrics within the dashboard? So other types of data to, to feed in that, or where, what's the best met? Is there a way to get metrics and data to, to populate that? You want to take that, Chris? Yep. Um, so we don't uh, provide specific services or guidelines for where those metrics will come from. You know, a lot of them require an understanding of that, how that information is collected within the community, um, whether they're reported through the health department, uh, aggregated up to the state or available at the county level. Um, but we do have a pro RGS pro project with a set of tasks that walk you through how you can take the information that you have and populate it into the layers that back the dashboard. Uh, and then for example, if you have daily case information or, um, results from positive tests, uh, you can then calculate the trend lines that drive the dashboard. So you can, you can do that as, as recommended by the White House, uh, a 14 day trend, or you could customize that to be longer out or shorter. So you have some flexibility there. Um, but ultimately where the data comes is, is gonna vary from community to community. And there was a question around um, for the in terms of the testing sites capability. Um, so someone said we are assessing options for handling evacuations for fire season in the age of COVID nineteen. So mm -hmm. could that those analysis tools be used um, to manage evacuation sites for during fire season? So um, so i.e. maintaining distances um, six plus foot distances within the shelters PPE for transportation so kind of reusing some of the location allocation tools for that analysis I think you could definitely reuse the I mean there's nothing specific in the um, tools that Lauren used to testing sites we've even thought about how we could use it for meal site locations as well too um, what Lauren and team have done, though, is orchestrated a set of tasks that walk you through that testing site process. Um, I mean, the, the testing site locator, though, didn't get into some of the specifics the question asked, like how do you maintain social distancing and things like that within the shelter. It would just help you find the optimum location for that shelter, though. Um, so I guess part of that question could be answered or, you know, the testing sites could be reused for part of it. Um, but one thing I do know is, you know, to that end, we have also, there are other parts of Esri and our professional services group in particular, they've been working with uh, convention centers and cities across the country here domestically on how, on field hospitals, and certainly some of the things inside the building uh, related to social distancing uh, and PPEs and other types of assets within the building. Um, was a key part of that. And how do you maintain social distancing inside those facilities? So there might be some work there that, you know, if you're talking about inside the building or inside that facility that could be leveraged, um, that has been done for a lot of the field hospitals that have been set up in major cities across the US. Any other questions, Matt? There was a question, mean, I guess the, the, it was more of a, I, I'll, I'll make the comment of, so there was a question about like uh, users, so users deploying the apps for their pub, the members of the public to you use kind of mobile mobile devices and things like that. So um, someone was saying, what do you recommend? But I think in general, all of the web applications you've seen are going to be responsive to mobile 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 devices, whether that's a tablet or a phone. Um, and in general, they'll just scale to the device appropriately. Right. So um, there's not any additional configuration you as a user would need to do to to kind of support that. So just make that comment. 
Yeah, that's a really good point, Matt. We do definitely think about that when we develop and design the solutions um, that we want to support them on multiple devices. Even Chris alluded to that with the recovery dashboard. We know that many people might be hitting that dashboard and looking for their metrics uh, for their community on a smartphone. So how does that dashboard scale for them too? So it looks like that's all the questions we had coming in. Well, thank you very much everyone for taking the time today to meet with us. All right, so that, that uh, concludes today's meetup. Uh, we wanna let you know that Esri is here to support you and your organization during these challenging times. Until next time, goodbye, thanks. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you.